So last week we jumped back into our series on the patriarchs. We had taken a little break during the, the summer and uh, for, our, for our community series, and now we're, we're back into the, the series on the patriarchs. We've been looking at stories from the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, even, even though he's not considered a patriarch. We'll, we'll get to him eventually. Um, but uh, we've been, you know, in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. And so last week we, we were in Genesis chapter 24, a long chapter, and I told you to, to read it ahead of time because it's a, a long chapter. Uh, but we learned, we learned last week that Sarah had just passed away and that Abraham's not far behind. And so he wants to make sure that his son Isaac has a wife. Very, very important, right? I mean, if, if they are to become a, a, a great family, a great nation, then, of course, it, it couldn't end with, with Sarah. The, Isaac needed a, uh, needed a wife as well. So he sends his servant on a, on a quest, on a quest to, uh, to Abraham's relatives to find a wife for his son. And, um, and then he has this journey. And then when he arrives, he has this very, very specific prayer to God, asking God to do this very, very specific thing in this very, very specific way. He asks for a sign. He's testing God. And, um, and once again, this is all review from last week, and our messages are, are online on the website, on YouTube, if you, if you missed it, and you just need to get caught back up. When we're reading and studying the Scriptures, we have to ask if this is uh, prescriptive or descriptive. Is this, is what we're reading about, is this prescribing something, a, a way that we should live, something that we should follow, something that we should repeat? Is this a, a behavior that's modeled for us? Or is this just de descriptive? Is this just describing something? Just describing what was happening in the story, what the people were doing, the choices they were making, not necessarily something for us to emulate or, or apply today. It's so important for us to ask that, prescriptive or descriptive. And sometimes, and here's the thing, as, as with most, most things, we're not going to always agree on what's prescriptive and what's descriptive. But I've always been taught that when we come to this, this, this prayer in Genesis chapter 24, the servant's prayer, that this is something that we should model, that this is, you know, that it's okay to, to ask for a sign or, or, or name it and claim it, as some people call it. You know, ask for a specific sign. You know, and this is very, very similar to the story of Gideon, and we talked about this last week, Gideon putting out the fleece. You know, we, God, I want the fleece to be wet, and then I'll know. Or no, I want the fleece to be dry, and then I'll know. And this is, this is asking for a, for a sign. And this is, this is not prescribing a way that we should pray. It's just describing what the servant was doing. A servant who may not have been, uh, may not have known God as, as his, his uh, master Abraham knew him. Didn't have the, the trust that his, that his master did. The, the, the servant was trying to control the situation, right? Trying to control God, trying to ask for a sign and answer in a very, very specific way. And I think he was showing a lack of trust that God would do what God said he would do because there really wasn't a chance. There wasn't a chance that God wouldn't provide a spouse for Isaac, right? Because God's eternal purposes depended on it. You know, his promise to make Abraham into a great nation to bring, to bring blessing to the nations through this one family. God will keep his promises. God is always faithful. God will make it happen. His will will be done. And, you know, as we mentioned last week, I love how Job puts it. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours will be thwarted. No purpose of yours will be thwarted. And so last week we, last week we talked about the fact that what the Bible is prescribing can be found more often in the big picture of Scripture, in the, the grand narrative of the, of the Bible from beginning to end, Old Testament to New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation, from cover to cover. And so the more time you spend in the Word, reading and studying, over your lifetime, you'll begin to see this. You'll begin to see. It, it, it'll make more sense. You'll see how the individual pieces and stories and verses fit, fit together into the whole. And different themes will emerge. You'll see these themes from the beginning all the way to the end and throughout the scriptures. And so today we're going to talk about one of those themes as we jump back into Genesis chapter 24. So you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis 24, open your Bible apps, or just follow along as I read. I'm going to read... First of all, from 
verses 12 through 21. Then he prayed, the servant, Lord God of my master Abraham, make me successful today. Show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to this young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of, son of uh, Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The woman was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and, and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough drink. We talked about this last week, how just because God answered his prayer doesn't necessarily mean that this is a model that we should follow, that God was showing tremendous patience. God was showing grace in the situation. So he quickly so she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. So, in this, these several verses, we see several things, several characteristics of Rebekah, things, things about Rebekah that make her a great wife for Isaac. We just read several things. It says she's beautiful. It says she's a virgin. It says that she's the, the granddaughter of, of Milcah and Nahor. And who's Nahor? Nahor is the, the brother of Abraham. So this seems very strange to us, right, nowadays, that Abraham would, would be adamant that they, they get a wife from one of his relatives, but that was very important, that they not find a wife from the Canaanites. And we talked a little bit about that last week as well. That was so important. These things about Rebecca that were that were really important, but I what I really want to focus on this morning is a really important characteristic of Rebecca that we probably tend to overlook. We just read right past, and it's not really a big deal to us. And it's her incredible hospitality towards the servant. The servant's a complete stranger to her. Complete stranger. Now. Let's talk about this for a little bit. When we picture a well, you know, and, you know, and several times in the Bible we read about the women coming out to the well to draw water. Maybe what's in our minds is, you know, this above ground structure and then, you know, the, the rope that you lower the, the bucket down into the, the well and then you fill it with water and you pull the bucket back up. But let's, let's read the ending of verse 16 again. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. So the well that we picture is not the type of well back in that day. This is, this is a, a, what a, a Middle Eastern cistern would have looked like back in that day. So you'd, you'd have to carry your jar down the steps, fill it with water, and carry it back up again. Now, some of these wells were deeper than others. Some were bigger than others. So, so, you know, therefore, some had more steps than others. And we don't know the specifics about this well that, that Rebecca was, uh, was at. But we know, we do know that this would have been a bigger deal than just filling a bucket from the well. Now, camels, camels can go for days without water. But when they do, they can drink as much as 25 gallons of water each each camel, up to 25 gallons of water at a time. Ancient jars used for drawing water could, could, could hold up to three gallons of water. So we're talking a lot of trips down the steps, a lot of trips back up the steps. Now, we're not told how many camels, you know, in the, in the story, but some scholars think they would have at least traveled with, with 10 camels, at least, Verses 19 and 20 again. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. This could have been at least 10 to 20 trips. Some scholars think it could have been as much as 
80 to 100 trips. We don't know. This is a lot of trips down to the spring and back, filling the trough for these camels. This was a big deal. And we read past this, but for a Hebrew reading this, this would have stood out. This, is what, this would have been a really, really big deal to them, the hospitality that she showed to this stranger. And for the servant, for the servant, I mean, this just indicated that Rebecca was the one, right? Rebecca was the one. You know, she was, she was the answer to his prayer. But this reveals something about her character. And the Hebrew people, for the Hebrew people, this would, have, this would have been a big deal to them. This would have really stood out. She was not only willing to give him a drink, but someone had to water the camels as well. She was willing to go out of her way, above and beyond, for a complete stranger. Who, who would show that kind of hospitality? And really, this should stand out. This should stand out in this story as a very, very important characteristic of Rebecca. And, and like I said, we might, not just, we might not pay attention to it because this really isn't a big, deal, a big deal today for us in our culture. Back in that culture, this was a big deal. And it's a big deal in the Bible. Hospitality throughout the scriptures, a really, really big deal. So what is biblical hospitality? It's the offering of, of food and drink and lodging, which they offered to the servant later on in the story. But it's way bigger than that. Biblical hospitality is the offering of community. It's the offering of relationship. It's welcoming a stranger, treating an outsider like an insider, making someone feel at home, making someone feel a part of the family. We experienced this, uh, this past year a little bit. Um, so we, this past spring break, we wanted to go on a, a trip with our family, but we, 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 wanted, we didn't want to spend a lot of money, you know? We had some expenses coming up, like college bills, and so we uh, wanted to, to go somewhere, but we weren't sure where to go. And so the, the beaten box said, hey, why don't you come with us? We've got, we've got a family, and we've got a, uh, we know some, some old friends in, in North Carolina. They have a big house. They have a pool and a lake, and um, they, they'd love to have you come stay with them. And, and at first we were like, ah, oh, we don't know these people at all. Isn't, would it be kind of weird to just stay in, the, with, in this home with these people that we don't even— we don't know and stay for a whole week and what's that going to be like and then you, you got to get up in the morning and you got your pajamas on you got your bed head and it's just it's just kind of weird like it's just not going to feel quite right but we decided to go and it was it was awesome i mean carlton and becky went completely out of their way to make us feel at home make us feel part of the family they cooked meals for us which we didn't even expect like every day they cooked meals for us. They had, they had food stocked for us. They uh, watched movies with us. They watched television shows with us. We had all kinds of incredible conversations with us. And then afterwards, you know, obviously Brian and Amy and the Beaten Box, they have known them for years. And when we left, we felt like, wow, we, we've known them for years when we really hadn't. They made us, made us feel at home. Such incredible hospitality. If we pay close attention when we open the scriptures. We're going to see, we see this is what God wants for his people. He wants his people to be characterized by this kind of welcoming of the stranger. This kind of hospitality feel, fills the pages, pages of the Bible. I mean, if we just look at some of the stories that we've read and studied in this series alone, in, in, in the Genesis Let's, let's just think about it for a second. Genesis chapter 14. We, we saw it modeled for us by Melchizedek, the priest king, towards Abraham. Incredible hospitality. We see it in uh, Genesis chapter 18, modeled by Abraham towards the three visitors. And then the very, very next chapter, Genesis chapter 19, we see the opposite happen, happening as the, the visitors go to Sodom. And, and this should stand out. We see, the, we see Abraham showing hospitality to these three visitors. We see Sodom doing the opposite, wanting to do harm to these three visitors. 
to these strangers, which is a characteristic of the, of the people of, of Sodom. This is highlighted. This is highlighted for a reason. We, we, we read later on in Ezekiel, and you can, you can read these verses on your own, but the prophet tells us that Sodom, the people of Sodom were arrogant, prideful, self-centered, self-indulgent. They pursued self-interest at the costs of others. And when Pastor Tim Hallman was here, he talked a little bit about this as well. Unwilling to be welcoming to the outsider, treating the outsider in harmful ways. And by the way, then when we get to the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 10, we read about how Jesus sent the disciples out, you know, and they were, they were declaring the kingdom of God. They were healing the sick. They were driving out demons. And, and, and what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if anyone will not welcome you, or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than, that, than for that town. You see the contrast here? Sodom and Gomorrah, known for not being welcoming to the outsider, the stranger taking care of the needs of the outcast. It'll be more bearable for them than for people who don't welcome disciples because this is a big deal a big deal to god but god's people god's people are different than this why this is this is this is amazing this is this is why rebecca was perfect for isaac i mean and you see all this fit together god's people are blessed to be a blessing god's desire is that the blessing spill over to those his people come in contact with more examples, and you can see this throughout the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 22, 21. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. The, the word for foreigner here means stranger, sojourner, alien, outsider, depending on, depending on what translation you're using. Leviticus chapter 19, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were a foreigner in Egypt. I am the Lord. I'm the Lord your God. Stranger, sojourner, alien. Deuteronomy chapter 10, and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners. Stranger, sojourner, alien. All, all over the Old Testament. All over the Old Testament, we see this. And then, and then in Joshua chapter 2, a very, very famous story that probably, if you've grown up in the church, you're very familiar with. Go back and read Joshua chapter 2 and be reminded of the story of, of Jericho and Rahab and the spies. Be reminded of, of Rahab, who was a foreigner, who was a prostitute. And what did she do? She welcomed, she welcomed these spies into her home, and then she was welcomed into the covenant family of God. And then we see her show up in the genealogy of Jesus. She had this characteristic as well. Over and over throughout the Old Testament, we, we also read that the prophets, the prophets over and over are reminding the people of God that God would judge them based on how well they cared for the widow, for the orphan, and the stranger how well they welcomed and cared for outsiders. Because they were once foreigners. They were once strangers. They were once on the outside looking in. We, th we see it through the new, throughout the New Testament as well. Jesus practiced and received hospitality from tax collectors and sinners. He even received it from a prostitute. She anointed him. When the crowds of people had overstayed their welcome... And the disciples said, let's send them away. Let's send them away. Jesus said, no. Let's feed them. Let's feed them. Luke chapter 14. T turn there real quick. Luke chapter 14. Let me find it here. Luke. 
Then Jesus said to his host, when you uh, give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may, they may invite you back and, and you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will, you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll re be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat of the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, and he tells this parable, a certain man was preparing a great, great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I, I just got married and I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servants go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done and there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come so that my house will be full. So that my house will be full. Turn also to Matthew chapter 25 and let's read this this is another famous parable of Jesus when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him he will sit on his glorious throne all the nations will be, will be gathered before him and he'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats he will put the sheep on his right the goats on his left then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see, see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This kind of generous hospitality towards the stranger, the outsider, the outcast, is, is a huge characteristic of the people of God, followers of Jesus. Hebrews 13, 2, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. This reminds me of Abraham and the three visitors. I mean, think about this for a while. First Timothy, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we, we see that hospitality is one of the qualifications for uh, leaders in the church, elders in the church. The ancient Romans practiced hospitality back in that day, but only towards important people and only for, for, for what they could get in return. And this is one of the reasons why the gospel spread so rapidly back in that culture because of the, the, the radical hospitality of the early church. So very different in that culture, in that society. They, they demonstrated something different, welcoming the stranger, treating outsiders like, out, like insiders. One more thing that I want to read about, uh, about Rebecca here before we move on. Let's turn back to Genesis chapter 24. I think this is pretty amazing because we typically just read right over this. Rebecca's not a big deal, right? Let's, let's read verses 54 through 59. Then he and the men who were with him, talking about the servant again, ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, Send me on my way to my master. Send me back to Abraham. But her brother, Rebekah's brother, and her mother replied, Let the young woman remain with us for ten days or so. Then you may go. But he said to them, Do not detain me, now that the Lord has granted 
success to my journey? Send me on my way so that I may go back to my master. Then they said, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with the man? I will go, she said. Does this remind you of anything? Does this remind you of someone? Way back in the beginning of this series, Genesis chapter 12. She's following in the footsteps of Abraham, right? She leaves her country, her people, her father's household to go to the land of Canaan, just like Abraham. Demonstrates the same kind of trust, just like Abraham. Like Abraham, she wasn't perfect, right? We see that as well. But she was the type of person that God was looking for. She had this incredible characteristic that God wanted for his people. Radical hospitality to the stranger. Why is this so important? Why is it so important? Why should it stand out to us when we read it? Why is it important for us today? Because it's a reflection of our creator. It reflects our creator's heart. And this kind of hospitality is at the heart of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. As Gentiles, we were, we were once on the outside looking in, we were once foreigners. We were once strangers. And Jesus, Jesus came to make a way for us. He came to, to welcome us into his kingdom, to welcome us into his family, into the household of faith. We're children of the king now. And since we were once on the outside looking in, since we were once foreigners and aliens and strangers, we now welcome others through our radical acts of hospitality offering food and drink and lodging, offering community and relationship, treating outsiders like insiders, making the stranger feel at home, blessed, blessed in order to be a blessing, the blessing spilling over, spilling over into the lives of others because this is exactly what God did for us and this is what God continues to do for us. So that's what we're going to remember this morning as we celebrate communion together.